thank you for settling down so quickly. Um, welcome to Deakin. My name is Simon Han. I'm the CEO of Deakin Prime. Uh, I know many of you, but uh, a few fresh faces, which is which is always great. Um, we always get a bit uh, nervous with breakfast events about whether the weather's good or any rain because it does uh, tend to cause a bit of attrition. So um, I know people have made an effort to get here this morning. We, we really appreciate that. Um, this morning uh, kicks off our first event at Deakin Prime for 2016 and is the third part in our 70 2010 breakfast series, um, focusing on the, the 70. Um, what has been great is that uh, Deakin Prime uh, has been heavily involved with 70 2010 going right back to the white paper we, we, we issued probably four years ago now. Um, and it worked very closely with probably the, the leading legend in the 70 2010 uh, movement being Charles Jennings. And uh, for those of you that aren't aware, and Charles is not here, but I'm going to do his book plug for him. Um, he's recently released a new, uh, very compact and easy to carry on the train and read book um, called 702010 Towards 100% Performance. Um, and uh, we've been fortunate to secure um, a number of copies, and uh, we, we do have a, a, a copy we're going to give away today to one lucky guest, so I'll talk about that at the end, but you do have to hang around at the end to claim the prize. <laughs> um, but really interesting, and I perhaps just wanted to start, I, I think there can be a lot of misconception around 70 2010, and I think for those of us in the, the learning profession, certainly for me, it's very compelling. So I just want to read a couple of paragraphs out of his preface, which I think just really frames it up really well in terms of uh, not only what it is, but what it offers to us as learning and development professionals. So just a couple of paragraphs from the preface. <clears throat> 702010 is an excellent way of inspiring L&D professionals across the globe to improve and innovate within the organisational learning process. It also encourages them to connect with new technology that has made learning easier. Ebooks, online courses, job aids, performance support and 24-7 learning by working. As a result of these experiences, we started a movement that uses 70-20-10 as a way of encouraging organisations to focus on holistic learning <clears throat> rather than simply providing a catalogue of formal training solutions. The movement invites people to create and share knowledge about 70-20-10 and use it to create a whole new perspective for L&D. We also provide L&D professionals with a list of five new roles they must adopt in order to become 70-20-10 experts, ensure that L&D is connected to their core business and helps to improve performance. The 702010 movement is not against training. We regard training as one of several ways to improve performance within organisations, but certainly not the only one. The movement uses the power of collective thinking to improve and innovate within our field of expertise. And I think it's that, that theme or that focus around improvement and innovation uh, where we've really seen some, uh, some excellent returns from the 702010 design process. So today, um, in the spirit of uh, the 70 being the focus, uh, we're going to get you to do a bit of work. And uh, so don't get nervous, it's, it's all pretty, uh, pretty easy and friendly. Um, so today's session is going to be facilitated by um, uh, three Deakin Prime people. Uh, David Hunter, our Head of Business Development. Uh, Wendy Palmer, Head of Learning Design. And Aaron Pradhan, uh, Head of Digital Learning Solutions over there. So um, without further ado, I'll ask David to come up and kick off the session. Thank you, Simon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, without further ado, I'll ask Morgan to join me. Well, this is a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, uh, good morning. We, we made a conscious decision not to use PowerPoint today and to go prop free, and I haven't quite managed. Uh, I've got uh, team member Morgan with me. He's not the prop. You asked for the hat, you got the hat. Oh, thanks. Uh, so this is uh, Morgan, one of our great team here at Deakin Prime, and uh, a quick training story. Uh, in September or October 2014, Morgan put his hand up to be a fire warden here at Deakin Prime and attended the training. The training consists of a very nice e-learning module and a two-hour training session. And uh, Morgan, I'll let you take the story up from there. I believe there was a small fire recently. Well, David, small fire is an understatement. Um, uh, E-learning module was uh, riveting. The uh, learning I did on the day was riveting and it held me in good fast for the rest of my life um, to the point where the fire occurred. First thing I did was put on my fire warden hat, as uh, we all know from the learning module we had to do, and then I proceeded to go to the whip phone and wait for the instructions. Then I proceeded to walk around the first the floor, did a tick off of all the deacon staff employees on the floor and marshaled them down the stairs. When they got down the stairs, I marshaled them to the marshalling area then proceeded to tick them off again, make sure there was no other people waiting on the floor. I went back to the building and confirmed with building management that um, everybody had in fact left the floor and we were all fine. 
and in the last leg area. Thank you, Morgan. Um, can anyone tell me what's wrong with this picture, apart from the hat? <laughs> <laughs> Just followed process. What was the impact of the training on Morgan? It was. It, I mean, I did it what, two years ago, and um, I was able to remember all that information. Pretty fantastic. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture is the fact that Morgan attended a small formal training event in September 2014, and you know, a year and a half plus later, he was able to recall exactly what he was required to do. You're here today to look at the 70 and 70 20 10, the place where most of the learning takes place. Um, of course, our firewood and training is much better than the way we just described it to you. <laughs> but the fact is, with a year and a half plus uh, gone by, and I know Morgan well, he struggled to remember where his hat was. So. Yeah, thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. So, welcome to the 70 Breakfast. Uh, today is about learning on the job, the vital learning that takes place outside the 10, the formal learning, and the 20, the social learning. Um, we're going to get you to do quite a lot this morning, but as Simon said, don't be too threatened by that. Uh, myself and Wendy and Aaron are going to work with you. Uh, in a moment or two, Aaron's going to take you through some key concepts around the 70 to begin, and then we're going to break you into three groups and take you around three stations in the room, and you can probably spot where they might be. Uh, the reason we're doing this is because this is about on-the-job learning, and this room is full of knowledgeable people. So we thought it was about time, it's not just because we're lazy, but we got the learning from you. So we're going to start with Aaron, he's going to take us through some uh, key concepts, and then Wendy, Aaron and I will present a bit more information about the stations we're going to be working with. Aaron. So Dan, do I just clip this in? Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to wander around, that's why, I, hopefully I won't give you a whiplash, but um, what I was hoping to do in about five minutes is give you a quick tour of some key um, paradigm shifts that I think um, that L and D are needing to make in this in this new field around 70 20 10. I'll start over here, and don't worry, people over there, you'll get ones on your side as well. If you can't see it from back there, there's an expertly drawn drawn robot here, which just looks amazing in 3D for the people at the back. You just keep quiet. <laughs> but what this says is explicit knowledge, and so far uh, in the L and D world, we tend to focus on explicit knowledge. We try to get um, quantifiable, descriptive knowledge into people's heads and that seems to be our aim. And one of the changes that we are making is that we, we know really what the thing is really about, what expertise and mastery are really about isn't just stuffing more things into people's head, but it's actually about tacit know-how. And actually linked to this is I, I'd like to change the L&D's job roles from L&D to helping people to survive the robot apocalypse. Because, as you know, there's a brilliant report from New South Wales, I think a few months ago, which actually you can type in, and Georgie will um, send out links, and I'll include this in, in, in the links, but you can type in a profession, and then it's got the percentage within five years' time of how likely it is to be replaced by a robot or by a smart, smart machine. And so, for example, accountants, we just did a uh, presentation recently, about 86% likely to get replaced in that traditional framework of accountancy. Um, so. It's quite surprising the sort of things that are knowledge based and just sort of very system based as opposed to the stuff that you sort of know how but it's actually quite difficult to explain. It's that sort of mastery and it's what makes us human. So the good thing about our, you know, the robot apocalypse stuff I sort of say jokingly but it's a real thing. I can, I'll send you some articles if you like in terms of um, people being replaced um, in terms of what their current roles are. But L and D have a massive role to play in basically supporting people to be more human and to bring out those human elements much more effectively. And that comes through tacit learning. It doesn't necessarily come through a course. So another, another paradigm shift that we're having to make is that our focus so far is learning and development. And with learning, it's all about knowledge, as opposed to what we really need to focus on at the moment is the question of performance. And this is probably something quite um, familiar with a lot of people here, is that rather than just focusing on what people know, it's what can they do? What is the, what's the business outcome that they can create with the intervention that you're making? And it sounds so simple, but this is probably one of the biggest paradigm shifts I've found um, to help approach any, any job or any new project, is basically saying, you know, so someone comes to you and they'll say, um, we need an e-learning module and people need to know X, Y and Z. And to take that step back and say, well, what's the business outcome you're trying to create? And what's the performance required? What sort of performance, uh, what sort of actions do people who we're working with need to take to create that performance outcome? 
So simple, and yet that's the powerful thing. And the good news here, again, this is all good news for L&D, is that suddenly, rather than just being in our little L&D world and just focusing on knowledge and learning, we're actually focused on business outcomes. And so we're, we're like popular people all of a sudden. <laughs> like, you know, it's like there's a perform like sales are going down. Who do you call? Pick up the hotline to L&D or, or a, a robot, robot apocalypse department or whatever you want to call ourselves in the future. So that's another paradigm shift. Over here, we've got, um, I've got five of these. So, so far, our bread and butter is basically creating events and courses. And that's the sort of commodity that we, um, you know, like really, it's like how many e-learning modules have we rolled out? How many training courses have we rolled out? That's what we judge our success by. But really, moving away from events and courses in this new mode of thinking, we're actually looking at campaigns and ecosystems. And I'm still looking for a better word than ecosystems because it seems a bit pretentious on one level. But really, well, firstly, campaigns. The idea that it's not just a one-off event that we're focusing on. We're actually focusing on, on developing continuous learners, people who are actually learning constantly and all the time. And to do that, it's actually a campaign. It's actually an experience that we're trying to create around them. Um, and partly, partly that's about ecosystem. So rather than just focusing on a course, so if this person needs to do X, Y, and Z to hit that performance outcome, how, what sort of environment can we create around them? What sort of mentors do they have to have in place? What sort of buddies do they, or shadowing system do they need in, to have in place? What sort of job tools? What sort of um, culture within the organisation? Um, what sort of processes do they need to hit that performance outcome? Knowledge is just a tiny, tiny part of that system. It's, it's just, and it's becoming less because, as, as we say, the knowledge-based stuff is going to be more automated. So it's about how can we support people to do more, to think more, to be more creative. And to do that, what sort of environment? And I call it ecosystem because it's almost one of the things I think for us is we have to get away from our controlling natures. I think partly um, with L&D, it's, it's um, I don't, maybe I'm just speaking for myself. Let's just say I'm speaking for myself so I don't offend anyone. Um, you know, the temptation is that when we're trying to create an event or course, we can contain it, we can like define it, we can really put the, put the parameters around it and we can test people on whether they get it or not. With this, it's actually a bit more challenging because we're actually trying to create an environment in which people will thrive and perform in uh, high performance levels. But things are going to happen out of our control. Like new, new peer groups, might, new communities of practice might, might spring up out of our, out of our, off our radar. And I think the challenge for us is to actually be happy about that rather than say, well, that wasn't what I was planning. So it's about trying to create the right, the fertile environment where that high performance and that tacit learning can actually happen. But let's move on to another paradigm shift. So excuse me for the people over there. I've got this amazing Venn diagram picture over here, which you can't see, it sort of pops out. So at the moment there's, learn, there's learning and there's work and they're considered to be two separate things. People work and even like right now, you've come out of your workspace, you've come to this to have a, a learning experience, then you go back to your work, to your work life. And that's um, okay sometimes, but at the moment that's the norm. We learn over there and then we work over here. We know from, from neuroscience and from evidence-based learning that we actually learn with our bodies and we learn from the environment that we're in. And so we actually learn contextually. Like, you know, even this, if, if I talk about this, what are the sort of paradigms that I'm talking about now, later, you might even picture this in the room. You know, we actually have a large visual and spatial memory that we actually draw on. And yet we, we learn in these separate environments to where we work. So I think one of the big tricks that we have to shift um, as, as people in this space is seeing learning as work and work as learning. So at the moment, what often happens is people are making a bit of shift to, to sort of say, OK, rather than your 30 minute e-learning module or your two day face to face session, we'll, we'll create some micro learning. We'll, we'll cut it up into bite sized pieces and we'll chuck it into the workspace. And that's a great start. But that's, and that's learning in work. So you're, at, you're in the workplace, you need something, you pull that formal learning element and you learn, you learn about it and then you get on with your work. That's a great step and that's a crucial step in terms of what we're trying to create here. But the, the, the next step is seeing work as the actual learning. And that's massive. In terms of that 70, and again, you know, the point of those numbers isn't to say that people are always going to learn 70% from experience. The point is to say it's a whopper. You know, it's like that you learn a lot from experience. And knowing that work is actually learning is crucial to say, for us to say, well, okay, 
if this is what people are doing in their workflow, this is what people are actually experiencing, how can we actually draw learning from that? How can we support them to draw learning from that as opposed to pulling them out over here, trying to fill their brain, and then them falling down that forgetting curve by the time they get back to work and forgetting most of it. Um, so that, that's the biggest challenge I think at the moment for us is to try to extract, and that's what this session is about, is to try to extract more learning from work as opposed to have work over there and then this idea of having a transfer to, to work. Now I'll end off um, in terms of these, these um, my sort of pseudo PowerPoint thing, um, looking at our role at the moment. At the moment, as I sort of mentioned, our role is often to create and manage learning content. That's what we do. We sort of create, co we, we you know, maybe go to people like Deacon Prime to say make this or we make it ourselves or whatever and then we manage it um, using LMSs or using whatever, whatever systems or people we need. And that is the major change I think happening now is that Again, L&D isn't going to cut it anymore. We do need a new name. And again, I've already booked my one, the Robot Apocalypse one. But at the moment, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be guiding people. We're going to be creating content still. There will be some creation of content. We'll be supporting um, users to actually generate their own content, to have user-generated content. We'll be priming people. Priming is massive and underrated. Like, in terms of an experience, in terms of what happens here, um, in, any, in any particular experience, the way people are primed, um, affects how they can learn effectively from a situation. So, um, I wasn't planning to go here, but I'm just, I just like, like, like these sorts of stories, so I'll just go here anyway. So even, I'm not sure if you read the, read the studies, for example, when people were actually doing a, a, a solving a problem in a, in a psychological test, and they had, a, I think there's a few hundred people trying to do this, solve this problem, and to one group they had a light bulb, and they just switched on a, a traditional light bulb in a lamp, which people could actually see the light bulb, and they switched on the light bulb before people started doing the problem. And those people actually solved the problem faster than the other group who just came into a normal room. And it sounds a bit voodoo-y, but even apparently the Apple icon, you know, on the Apple computers has the same impact. If people see that, they get more into a creative kind of mindset and creative space. It's actually quite easy to prime people in a number of different ways. And so we, and marketers know that all the time. So we need to know that too in terms of how we can quite upfront say, you're going to have this experience. This is, this is what you need to focus on. These are some of the things you need to draw on most. And that's where the 10 comes in. So even what I'm doing here, I'm actually providing a bit of scaffolding, introducing some concepts and paradigms for the discussions that we're going to have next. That's pretty much the same thing as priming. Um, this idea of seceding things. So like, we're not going to control all these experiences. We're not going to control or even design all these things. But we can actually put some seeds out there which will grow. So it might be that we see, what we often do, for example, is in the 20 space, is we create in, in um, campaigns or programs that we, we do, we often do things like um, cohort coaching, where we've got like a small group of six people, some coaches, and what we're trying to do there is uh, seed a community of practice. So you've got like these six people who are working together with our help for a period of a, of a few months, and then we pull away the scaffolding. And the ideal is that those people have built up the relationships, the trust, the safety, that they're going to continue to be a community of practice. Or they might create other groups because they've had the skills that we've, we've um, presented initially. So it's how can we sort of launch this, lear this new sort of learning that's happening. And there's also inspiring and curating. So they're the sort of paradigms that I wanted to go through. And I'll, we'll leave those up. But also I would like you to refer to the diagram that we've handed out too because that sort of summarises some of the things I've talked about. The top one is that old school, if you like, the sort of training program, the training paradigm that it's all about the training. It's all about knowledge. It's all about doing a learning event over there and then having a transfer of knowledge to the workplace. And the new, the new approach that we're trying to do is almost is starting with the outcome, the people, but also the workflow and looking at how people are actually working now and how can we actually draw more learning from that work. work. And to support that through some formal elements, through micro-learning, but also on the job tools and so on. So in particular today, David talked about how we're going to have these three sort of groups which will rotate people through. Um, and there'll be discussions, basically, facilitated discussions on three different topic areas. Uh, continuous learning culture, which is really a, a massive, because you know, when people go to school, you know, the thinking that you go to school is you go to a classroom and you learn about the world. If you had a continuous learning culture, you'd actually 
see the world as your classroom. You'd actually learn from experience. You'd actually see how you'd actually learn from, like, from everything. And yet from the beginning, we're telling people, go to a classroom and learn about the world here. Um, it's quite a, it's quite a, um, like a nasty kind of uh, mindset thing that we're actually creating in children. But, and then we're expecting them to be continuous learners. So it is a conscious thing we have to, we have to overcome now. Um, experimentation and reflection, uh, which Wendy will be talking about, and on-the-job performance tools, which I'll be, I'll be facilitating. So David, that's my bit. So do we want to start introducing the different areas? Sure. Yeah? So... Yeah, but I'll introduce that. Yeah, great. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, so, uh, as, as we've just heard, we're going to move around the three stations. We're going to hear a lot, a lot of this from you. We'll build, uh, through using scribes, we're going to build up the boards and hopefully fill them and not overfill them. And then we'll turn that into something that we can send out to everybody um, shortly after the event. So the, the area that uh, my station is going to be looking at is uh, continuous learning culture. This is an area that's of particular interest to me as a leader, as somebody who's been in L&D for 20 or 30 years. Um, uh, and I've reflected on a few different things and put a couple of key questions up there. One is how do we create an environment where people learn on the job? And at Deacon Prime, internally as well as externally, we're always looking for new ways for people to learn on, on the job. Uh, one of the things that we're trying out at the moment is uh, working out loud. So we're using our chatter platform, but you could use almost any you know, social platform, for example, to work out loud. And it's proven to be much easier than I would have anticipated. Members of our team simply share what they're working on and almost organically, and we're a learning organisation, so maybe it's a little easier than some organisations, uh, people get involved in that. I describe on working on this proposal at the moment, and someone says, oh, I worked with that organisation, chips in some ideas, and before we know it, my proposals become better. So all the things that we're working on, we're trying to share through working out loud, is going pretty well and getting better all of the time. So these concepts of creating an environment where people learn on the job are critical um, to what we'll be discussing and drawing from you guys um, in, the, in the next part of the session. Uh, the second area is how do we create a growth mindset? How do we move away from a fixed mindset into the concept that it's okay to try and not get it right first time, into the concept of, you know, not yet. You're not going to get the A first time, you're not quite ready yet. How do we encourage that in the workplace? A workplace where traditionally people feel quite vulnerable and don't want to be seen to not get it absolutely right the first time. And thirdly, an area that I'm particularly passionate about is the role of the leader and leaders in learning and learning in the workplace. And a lot of us will know the experience where we're asked to deliver training and learning outcomes in an organisation. And I've certainly heard this over the years, not just at Deacon Prime. The leadership is right behind this program. And one of my experiences is that's great. What we'll need is a couple of leaders to come to the first formal day of the program. There's not anyone actually available to come to the first day of the program, but we are right behind it, 100%. So I've, among many other things produced over the years, a kind of a, a checklist of all the things we want leaders to do to support learning, including learning in the workplace. And that just includes simple things like turn up to the formal training events, acknowledge the outcomes, acknowledge success from the outcomes. So when someone in a team does a piece of training, Tell the rest of the team, the reason that he's doing that now is because of that training outcome. Or, oh, how did you learn to do that? Through the training, getting things out there. Another of the tips, and I won't go through my whole list, I know them quite well, um, is making learning a priority, treating it the same as all other work events. As a facilitator in the past, I've turned up to more than one training day where everyone's been pulled from the training day because of some crisis make a training event, make the coaching, make everything else just as much a priority as everything else in the workplace. So these are the sorts of things I'd like us to talk about when we discuss what is the role of the leader and leaders in creating the continuous learning culture. So I'll be getting most of it out of you, they're just points to get us started. And Wendy will now talk through her station. Thank you. So today, um, my particular area of focus in looking at the 70-20-10 is, um, for want of a better word, experimentation or practice. And how do we actually encourage people to take uh, new skills and knowledge and actually become good at it by practicing it, by experimenting, 
I think one of the quotes I've got up in my area is the, the lovely Einstein one about, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting something different to happen. And so what we want to look at is how we actually encourage that. And I just wanted to share a little example to get you thinking in um, how, as L&D, we can support this is in one of our current uh, leadership programs. Uh, in webinars, we uh, provide people with ideas around, um, one example is you know, communicating with influence. And we give them some simple steps or a simple framework that they can try. And then we say, right, go out in your meetings, try this, experiment with it, and then come back and reflect on it. And with them, as part of the program, we build in um, the concept called Coffee with Self, weekly reflection. But it's not about strategic thinking, it's not about looking at what other people are doing, it's very much focused on what did I do, what could I have done differently, what went well for me, what didn't work, why didn't it? And it's those questions around looking at what have I done, trying something new, and then looking at how did it work. And so that's what I want to talk about in um, my experimentation and reflection section. I look forward to chatting with you in a moment. And so the third um, the third station, if you like, is going to be around job tools and um, just-in-time learning. And I'll introduce Jeremy in a sec, but just to give some context to it, is um, the way I see this, this area is that, you know, we've got working memory and we've got our prefrontal cortex, which is trying to actually do all the thinking and trying to do all the decision making. And that our working memory, even though our brains are m massively powerful, our working memory can actually get, is actually like a really small workbench, which only, only so few things can fit on it at any one point in time. Every time we're actually like, Listen, as you're listening to this, you're drawing on knowledge that you already have from your long-term memory and you're whacking what I'm saying and what's going on in your long-term memory and you're whacking it on the workbench and trying to actually make sense of it and working out what you're going to chuck back into that long-term memory. And that workbench is tiny. Every time we try to put something there, every time you remember that you didn't buy bread and you've got to do that on the way home, you're clogging up your working memory. And so for me, the whole point of um, on-the-job tools and and um, just-in-time learning is trying to clear your workbench for what you want to focus on. The example I often give is Obama, when he went, apparently when he became president, one of the things he did was just get a cupboard with really similar suits. So it was just like no brain. He didn't want to make a decision about what suits he wore because he wanted to save his cognitive power for other sort of more pressing issues, like what dog they're going to buy. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but the point is, I guess, that, you know, Every time you clog up your head with something, with knowledge that you don't need to, every time we inflict knowledge on a learner who doesn't need that knowledge to actually hit their performance outcome, we're actually making them more likely to be replaced by a robot. That's my thinking of it. That's why I thought it Every time you're clogging up their thing, you're, you're deadening how they're actually able to think, how creative they can be, how, how much they can do problem solving. So our job isn't actually to get more knowledge in people's heads, it's actually to reduce the knowledge as much as possible and turn it into other things in their ecosystem that can support them. Okay, now it's your turn. Uh, in a moment or so, uh, you'll all have in front of you a beautiful picture of a plant. Uh, I'd like to thank Naya from our multimedia team for drawing this on the weekend. Um, and I'd like to apologise because Naya and I had a big conversation about common plants and then I went and sourced three very uncommon plants from the local florists. <laughs> Thank you for your great work. In a moment, uh, Wendy, Aaron and I will hold up a larger copy of one of those pictures and you'll all flock to us to join in a, a, a discussion. And then Kate and Rennie and Morgan uh, from Deacon Prime will act as scribes and build up this uh, beautiful board of work, your work, that we'll then send out to you in some form within a couple of days of um, this morning's session. This is open discussion. We don't exactly know where this is going to go. And um, we have uh, Prasan, our client business manager, who's going to act as time for something. We'll go with seven, seven, and six. Uh, and so the third session will be slightly shorter because there'll be so much amazing stuff already on the three sets of boards. Um, as the session finishes, Prasan will call time. He is the law in the room. You don't want to see Prasan. Um, and then I'll ask you in Morgan's language to move in a calm and orderly fashion to wherever your picture is being held up next. Are there any questions? Okay, let's go. We'll move to our station. I'm able to grow. I'm not quite getting right. And what's the role of the legal? So we're trying to mimic what he does, but just have it on the computer to make us like, almost go through the same process. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you everyone uh, very much. Um, I can thank the, I can thank the three groups. As I do with my three children, I'll tell you that I have a favourite. You know who you are. I don't think you all did very well. Um, I'm just looking around the room at how much has been built up on the other board. It's fabulous, and this will really allow us to put something together to send out to you. But I'm going to do a quick debrief. I'd love a couple of people in the room just to share what they found particularly useful. And, and as we're doing that, I'd encourage you to make any notes of what you found particularly useful um, on the back of the takeaway sheet as well. But a couple of people like to share what they found particularly strong or useful that they can take away from today's session. I just found it interesting in the examples, uh, sorry Kate from Deacon Drive, how much is to be learned from other disciplines outside of learning development. So people manage project management, as people mentioned project management methodologies, marketing and what's to be learned when Aaron was talking about primary learners. So I think even you know for ourselves in the reflection piece, what are other disciplines of work doing that uh, traditional learning and development functions can learn from? Uh, because we tend to work with each work within ourselves and uh, not always step outside learning development to look at what might work for us. That's fantastic, thank you. Um, I liked um, the way you modelled the whole process from the start of breakfast. And uh, I'm my favourite too, it's your group. And the one I liked was uh, the idea of facilitators as leaders and leaders as facilitators. That's that's yeah. great, thank you. One more? I had a takeaway. I think most of my station we talked about the role of the leader and leaders, but there was a really salient point made, which was leaders are not experts in everything. We're looking to them to lead and lead by example, but, but they're not the font of all knowledge. And so everybody has this vital part in creating the continuous learning uh, culture and, and enhancing it, and in bringing the 70 to life in the work. Um, to wrap up my part of this, I'm going to ask everybody, and uh, when we first got together in, I think, early December to talk about this uh, session, uh, we wrote a quick list of what the outcomes we wanted for you from the session. And I said that I think training sessions are always great if you walk away with a new thing and at least one commitment, something you can take away and do differently. So I'm going to encourage all of you, you've got about two minutes, to share at your table if you'd like, but to write at the bottom of the sheet one commitment, something you're going to do differently as a result of today's session. <laughs> um, guys, thank you very much. Our commitment's getting me out of here by nine. Simon's got the all-important um, door prize. I'd like you all to give yourselves a round of applause because most of this was down to you. Thanks, David. Great session. Uh, won't drag this out. Um, one of you on your card should have a Deacon Prime sticker on the back of your card. Yes. Yes, we've got a winner. Excellent. I think that was mine. You've <laughs> <laughs> already got one. Congratulations. Thanks again, everyone, for your participation. Um, keep an eye out for uh, future events at uh, Deacon Prime. We always love having you uh, here and sharing with us.